What's up, everybody? Today we're going to talk about ALS. And so this is called amyotropic lateral sclerosis, A being none, myo being muscles, the tropic being the function. So the muscles just stop working. So remember, this is going to be motor neurons affecting the lateral columns of the corticospinal tract. Remember, our corticospinal tract is where our main motor neuron tract is happening. So let's get into it. So anatomy, as I kind of mentioned before, this is going to be affecting both of the upper motor neurons and the lower motor neurons. So this is one of the only conditions that really affects both. So we see both the like spasticity and the clonus and everything associated with an upper motor neuron disorder. Then we also see the flaccidity and the atrophy of the muscles and like just the fasciculations, disuse atrophy, um, that's associated with lower motor neuron disorders. So this is a two for one special. Um, so this is going to be in destruction of most of the anterior horn cells and alpha motor neurons. These are all of the neurons in the CNS and then into the um, lateral columns of the spinal cord that are all going to be primarily motor neurons. So it's a lot of big words, guys, but I, all I want you guys to get out of this motor neurons are affected, sensory remains relatively intact. So unfortunately this person can't move, but they can still feel everything. They can feel the discomfort of their body squishing on itself as it becomes a restrictive lung disease. It is a very sad condition. I'm gonna to try to just keep this as upbeat as possible, but this is a very depressing uh, condition to go over. So essentially, as I was saying before, the corticospinal tract is affected and that is why it's an upper motor neuron part because that starts in this, um, in the cortex of the brain all the way down. This is our main motor neuron pathway. And that's why we see that it's damaged to it. It's deteriorating. That's why we see the positive Babinski sign. Remember that's where we run it up and across and the toes splay in a normal person, the toes will curl. And so we see the Babinski sign. That's why it is a corticospinal tract kind of thing. Cause we see that that indicates that it's a corticospinal problem. The motor neurons are degenerating, which means that their motor neurons are not sending signals to the muscle. The muscle is not contracting. Therefore we'll have disuse atrophy of the skeletal muscle cells. And remember our diaphragm is a skeletal muscle that we you know, voluntarily control. And once that one kind of goes to crap, you're, you're done. That's why we'll have those cause of death due to ALS is going to be respiratory failure due to failure of the diaphragm. And a lot of these individuals in end of life care are going to be on a vent to essentially prolong life. A lot of individuals elect to just say, let's keep them comfortable and let them go. So let's go into the etiology of this. In most cases of ALS, it's random. It's unknown. Like 90% of cases, it's like, oh, you got ALS. It's random. Um, there's some evidence to support that there is a genetic link. So if like a family member has been diagnosed with ALS or has you have a familiar history of ALS, they think it might be autosomal dominant kind of thing. And genetics are weird just because you'll inherit an autosomal dominant trait doesn't mean you'll actually express it. True genetics is random. But for this one, I would say when we're thinking about ALS to understand that Yes, of an individual, like if we're treating, because remember this is a family centered care when we have terminal diagnoses to make sure that the caregivers and family members are aware this could have a genetic component, have them get tested, just kind of, you know, peace of mind if that's what they elect to do, having them understand it's an option that should be done by the neurologist though, but for us just kind of understanding like what they're probably going to be told. Other theories, along with many other random neuro conditions, we'll see that like sometimes a viral infection will just kind of screw everything over and then cause the exacerbation of this to kind of arise. So like, let's say you have the gene, the gene's just chilling, it's turned off. All of a sudden you get a viral infection, it turns that gene on and says, oop, let's get ALS. That's kind of what happens with this, can happen with Guillain-Barre, can happen with, um, oh, there's a bazillion other diabetes mellitus, pretty much anything that's going to be the body attacking itself. That can kind of happen with that. Any sort of like, you know, diabetes, other metabolic conditions could also exacerbate the, you know, presentation of ALS and kind of make it happen. Um, and there's some support to say that they might think that there's a connection between lead poisoning and ALS, but we can't really ethically test that because that would mean we'd give people lead and then see if they develop ALS which um, isn't really ethical and not allowed. So got to have a review board to prove that. So big thing to understand for the NPTE is that peak incidence of ALS is going to happen between 40 and 70 years old with men presenting more often than women. So the incidence is higher in men than women. And these are people in between ages 40 to 70 years old. Um, so I would say like middle age to 
Medicare age kind of thing. That's what we're seeing with these individuals. So what does it look like? We are going to have, um, it's going to present with muscle weakness and it's gonna present unilaterally from distal to proximal. So we're gonna see that this patient is going to present with, this is the biggest thing, it's going to present unilaterally. So remember with Guillain-Barre, that's bilaterally. With ALS, it's unilaterally from distal to proximal. It's always presenting distal to proximal. Remember with Guillain-Barre, we can get muscle function back. Once muscle function's gone with ALS, it's gone. So it's gone, gone. So we want to see that we understand that this is going to be unilaterally. So we'll see like one toe starts tripping, one hand stops being able to grasp something, something along those lines. Like it's one side and then It'll progress, but it'll progress on both sides eventually. Just you'll start seeing it. Like, it's like, I keep tripping over my left foot. Like, why do I keep tripping over my left foot? With uh, Guillain-Barre, it would be like both feet are starting to go. ALS, unilaterally, distal to proximal. Understand that, that that's what's happening with ALS. Um, as I said before, we'll have both upper and motor neuron, motor neuron involvement. So that means with upper motor neuron, we're seeing all that, like, you know, high tonicity, high spasticity, all that stuff, the clonus, remember clonus is when you do like a reflex and it keeps going like that. So um, there's videos on clonus, definitely look it up. It's really like weird, um, but you'll see like you do the reflex and it just keeps going, it just keeps going. It's kind of crazy. Um, so that's an upper motor neuron thing. Um, and then Babinski sign, as I said before, that's going to show up again. And it's bad if we see Babinski signs in anybody over like four months old, because that means that there is a lesion or a problem with the corticospinal tract. Remember, that's our main motor neuron pathway. With lower motor neuron involvement, that's where we see the atrophy, the muscle wasting, the weakness. And then we'll see these things called fasciculations. And I don't know if you've ever had like a really, really terrible cramp where you can see the little muscles moving on the inside kind of thing if we're looking at my tent tendons or something like that it'll you can like see the muscles starting to contract and that's because they're trying to contract but they can't because there's not enough signal from the motor neuron so it's just like a little, little kind of thing going on that would be an indicative of this is a very characteristic sign we'll see with als but also other lower motor neuron problems with this individual we're going to see a gradual loss of function and mobility so that means that maybe one month they're able to do sit the stands independently the next time like the next two months later, they're going to need a meniscus or at least contact guard because they're starting to lose their balance. This is where we see that this is starting to take a toll on the individual and their families because at first they're like, oh, I'm just tripping, I'll be fine. And then all of a sudden, like six months later, they're losing their ability to walk. Um, so this will start by, as I kind of mentioned before, and this is unfortunately how people find out they have ALS. They uh, start complaining of tripping, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes, unfortunately, they'll end up getting sent to us first. And by us, I mean a physical therapist. And they'll be like looking at this. And um, I have had PTs I've worked under that did have to refer patients that came in with tripping and loss of grasping OTs that I know um, that they come in either direct access or something else. And they're like, ah, they got to go back to a neurologist. And this is one of the things where, you know, where we send somebody to a, uh, or like some specialists, we're like, okay, we, we, we think it's this, we got to make sure it's this so then we can treat it. This is one of the things we wish we were wrong about. So this is something that we'll see with this patient. That's why we kind of have to be aware of it. So we can see, is this just a general, this muscle sucks and it's weak, or is this neuro involvement? Fortunately, this is one of those neuro involvement things. Again, we'll see muscle wasting in the and atrophy in the extremities. So like in the hypothenar eminence, so that's the pinky side or in the thenar, which is the meaty thumb side, we'll start to see that the muscle is starting to deteriorate, it's starting to get weak, and we're losing that intrinsic muscles of the hand and wrist area. And that's where we'll start seeing, um, you know, a physical presentation of the disease. And, um, as I kind of mentioned before, the most unfortunate thing is that it will start to have respiratory involvement because of the uh, involvement of the diaphragm. And that is unfortunately where we see that these patients are going to end up passing away from this condition because of the diaphragm being a skeletal muscle. Um, the phrenic nerve, that is the motor neuron that will innervate the diaphragm, just to let you guys know. And unfortunately, this is a terminal diagnosis and the average life expectancy following diagnosis is two to five years after diagnosis due to respiratory failure. That is an important number to know. The boards will quiz you on that. And then I also want you guys to understand this is a restrictive lung disease. 
And that is because um, anything that's restrictive lung disease is impeding the lung's ability to function. So the fact that we're having, you know, motor neuron involvement with the diaphragm, similar to how with Guillain-Barre, we would see uh, motor ner neuron involvement with the diaphragm. And also because this individual is going to lose postural control of their muscles, their lungs are going to be squished. So this is one of those restrictive lung diseases. How are we treating it? The biggest thing with ALS is we're trying to keep the patient at the maximum level of function, function for as long as possible. If this patient can still walk, we want to keep them walking as long as possible. Does that mean we give them a quad cane? Sure. Does that mean we give them a walker? Awesome. Does that mean we give them an AFO? Sure. We want to keep them functional as possible for as long as possible to maximize this patient's quality of life and to help them feel a little bit better. Um, patient and caregiver education is important with this patient. As I said before, anybody with a terminal diagnosis or if it's a child involved, generally we're focusing on family-centered care or whoever's the caregiver in this case. And this is just to make sure they're aware of what's going on. Like the neurologist should do the brunt of this stuff because they get paid the big bucks. Like they need to be doing the brunt of this work when it comes to educating the patients on what's to come. But we're gonna be working with them a lot, way more than the physician is gonna see them. So we kind of also have to do some education on our part to have them be like, okay, so this patient is having problems with whatever. Here's how we teach the family members how to perform these like bed transfers, mobility, how to make sure that the patient is using their assistive device properly, educating the patient on like, you know, bed mobility, transfers, wheelchair mobility, whatever they'll need, things that they'll need in the future. So like, let's say the patient's like, you know, tripping over stuff. We're like, okay, we'll get them an AFO. For now, that'll be what we tre treat them with, um, understanding that eventually they will lose their ability to walk. So we're thinking wheelchairs later down the line. So then we can kind of let the family know what's going on. Um, another thing, and this is super important, this patient is gonna be depressed. This patient's going to be upset and they're gonna be kind of you know going through the stages of grief and dying. So we want this patient and their family members because it's gonna take a toll on everybody to go to therapy. I'm talking psychotherapy. And this is just so then we can have the patient, you know, work through um, all their feelings, all their like, you know, being upset about their disease, being like, why me, all that stuff. That is something that therapy can help with, help the family kind of go through the stages of grief, work through everything together. Um, and this will also improve their quality of life. Just having someone professional to talk to that is like, you know, has been on hospice, that work with hospice care and everything. Like the therapist that I work with, she has, um, well, it's my therapist. Like I go see her. She has had experience with like people who got through hospice and stuff like that. And she was kind of educating me on how we can, it's a different approach to therapy than just like regular therapy. So just kind of helping the patient understand the risks and benefits of going to therapy along with their family to kind of work through all that stuff. Cause this sucks. This is like a very unfair, honestly, all these conditions are very unfair and they're awful and they take a toll on everybody. So have a professional help work through the five stages of grief and dying and understand that we got to understand what they're going through as well. So then we can help treat them in the therapy aspects. So when it comes to therapy aspects and PT interventions, we do not want to overexert this patient. When we lose, like if we overdo it with the muscles and we make them super sore, they could lose function of those muscles. Same kind of thing going on with like Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We don't want to overwork the muscles because that will be way too much for this patient. And they could be sore for days and start to lose the ability to walk a little bit sooner. So energy conservation techniques are key. We don't want to do extreme progressive resistive exercises like the, like we would rather just adapt and then adapt, improvise, and overcome with this patient rather than being like, let's push it pedal to the metal, like overexert. Now it's better for this patient to just like, instead of us doing like really complicated strengthening and balancing stuff with them to just get them like an assistive device. It's better for this patient. It's better quality of life. Um, and with that being said, wheelchairs, assistive devices, bed mobility and training to keep the patient as functional as possible for as long as possible. This is a big thing. And that's what I'm saying. Like if the patient can still walk, don't put them in a wheelchair kind of thing. If the patient can still like grab objects and move around on their own a little bit, we don't need to get them a personal care person because they're still able to do stuff. Keeping the patient as independent as punk, uh, independent as, and functional as possible for as long as possible is key with any sort of progressive like um, conditions such as ALS or you know uh, Huntington's disease, Alzheimer's, stuff like that. Uh, orthotics fitting. So if they need an AFO, get them an AFO. If they need splinting, get them a splint. Like 
we're trying to make sure the patient is as comfortable and you know independent as long as we can. If we're going to do an exercise with this patient, just some just generic stretching, low intensity aerobic exercise, walking, you know, nothing too crazy. We're not running marathons here. We're just doing our thing. We're doing our thing with this patient. We're just keeping them, you know, happy. So this is going to be with this patient and because it is a terminal diagnosis and there's a lot, a lot, a lot going on. This is an all hands on deck approach with, you know, speech, OT, and eventually our respiratory therapist coming in to help maximize patient's function. And we'll have respiratory therapists come in because remember the diaphragm is affected and the respiratory system will begin to fail. And that is ultimately what will cause this patient to pass away. So remember it's a restrictive lung disease. We'll start having a lot of buildup of like CO2 and stuff. So with this being said, we want to make sure everybody's involved. Everybody's communicating. We're all talking to the patient, talking to each other. This is an interdisciplinary approach. So keywords for this is I want you guys to understand when it comes to ALS, this page is like pretty much everything in a nutshell. Um, the progression of the disease is going to be unilaterally from distal to proximal. So the hands and feet are affected first, like on one side, eventually the other, and it'll progress up from the hands into like the wrist, forearm, elbow, and eventually up into the shoulder as it progresses closer to the diaphragm, which is what the muscle that will ultimately fail and cause this patient to pass away. All everybody's involved with this patient caregiver education on everything of what's going on with the condition, going to therapy, getting like treated by different specialists, like what to expect, all of that stuff, because eventually this patient will not be able to take care of themselves and they will need somebody else to help take care of them and complete their ADLs. So everyone needs to be involved. Um, energy conservation techniques. We don't want this patient to overexert themselves because that will exacerbate and accelerate this condition. This is already a really quick demise with this patient. We don't want to be the reason why they can't continue with therapy. And we don't want to make this worse. Again, we want to make sure keeping the patient as functional as possible for as long as possible. And I'm going to keep saying that because it's so important because people will choose questions. Like the, the patient will be able to walk and the answer will be like, give them like an, a, a, like a walker or something. And somebody, somebody's going to say, put a Hoyer left in. Like somebody says, no, not yet. Maybe later, but not right now. What does the patient need right now? They need a walker. So <sighs> assistive devices and mobility training is, is key with this patient to maximize their level of independence and function. Remember with ALS, the motor neurons are affected. The sensory are relative, like, like pretty much intact, like maybe like 90% functioning. Motor neurons will go all the way down to zero. So motor neurons are absolutely just, they're, they're, they're getting really hit hard by this one. Um, remember this is an upper and a lower motor neuron involvement. So remember, we'll see all of the different types of, you know, spasticity, clonus, and we'll see the flaccidity and the atrophy of the muscles. We'll see both going on with this patient. And the important thing to understand, because the board's likes to quiz you on this, is this patient will succumb to this disease within two to five years on average. I think like 20% of people live a little bit longer. I mean, um, Stephen Hawking had ALS for like 20 years or something crazy like that. Like some people do live longer, but understanding that most patients are going to pass away within this two to five year average lifespan following diagnosis. And that's following diagnosis. They might start presenting with symptoms like three years earlier and then by the time they get diagnosed. That's why it's a little bit of a wider range. So sample question. A physical therapist assistant is treating a patient diagnosed with amyotropic lateral sclerosis. The patient states they are becoming upset and distraught about their condition and are no longer focused on therapy and unmotivated to perform any activities. What should the therapist do next? One, give the patient a motivational speech and persuade them to continue the therapy session. Two, inform the patient that they have the right to be discharged from therapy if they would like to be. Three, explain to the patient the risks and benefits of psychotherapy to help them adjust to living with a terminal diagnosis. Or four, terminate the therapy session and call the patient's neurologist. So I'll give you guys a second to think about that.
All right, guys. So the answer is number three, explain to the patient the risks and benefits of psychotherapy to help them adjust to living with a terminal diagnosis. So I'm going to talk about why this one is the correct answer and um, why this is what we should immediately do next. Let's talk about the other answers. Number one, giving the patient a motivational speech to persuade them. That's not going to help. I'm sorry. Like you could like motivation is fleeting. They're going to learn the skills they need themselves in order to motivate themselves and keep disciplined and keep focused in psychotherapy that us giving like a motivational speech. I don't know if anybody's ever been like, like you've been like, Oh, like my dad died or like your grandpa died or something like that. They're just like, you just got to keep pushing for them. Yeah. You got this. Like, Oh my God. Like what? No. Read the room guys. That's not going to help this patient. The patient's going to need professional help and professional interventions to teach them the tools in order to motivate themselves and have that come intrinsically rather than extrinsically from a therapist. Some people might respond well to that, but the better answer is number three, if we keep reading on. Number two, inform the patient they have the right to be discharged from therapy if they would like to be. So this patient said, I'm sad. So you're like, okay, well, you can leave if you want to. Is having them leave therapy going to help them keep as independent as possible, maintaining their level of function as long as possible? No, it's not going to help them. Like the patient should already be aware that they have the right to be discharged if they need to. Like saying this right now is also like a read the room kind of thing. This person needs help rather than you just like kicking them to the curb kind of thing. Um, that's kind of, that's why this answer is not appropriate. Uh, number three, explain to the patient the risks and benefits of psychotherapy to help them adjust with terminal diagnosis. Now, if you weren't sure about the other ones, by the time you got to this question, you should have been like, ooh, that's a good one. Because we, like the PT is going to have to talk to the physician to get a referral to psychotherapy, but putting that little nugget and educating the patient on what psychotherapy is, how it will help them adjust to their life with a terminal diagnosis, how it will help them, you know, like benefit from, like mentally from being able to live with this, having their family come with them and stuff like that. Like this is going to help the patient the most, like really like why did like half of you guys are like, when I ask you guys why you want to be a PTA, you're like, I want to help people. Well, this is going to help them. The other ones might not help. Like maybe one might help that some people, number two, getting rid of them. That's not going to help them. Like that's not going to help them. Number three, sending them or like, you know, refer out if you need to referring to the right people, because this is an all hands on deck kind of thing with this patient. We want the right person to help the right people. Like you guys came to me for help with NPTE because you felt like I was the right person to help you rather than asking your mom or something like that. Like you refer to the right people to help with whatever problem you have. Now let's say you have problems with, oh, I don't know, something random. Uh, like you're having, what's something random that you could have a problem with? I don't know. Um, you need help putting together your, you know, bed frame or something like that. Well, I got like lateral up condolies right now for putting together this desk. I can't help you with that. So you would get somebody who's a professional to help you with that. Something on those lines. We want the right professional to help this patient. Number four, saying terminate therapy and call the patient's neurologist. I mean, you could do this, but like we see that number three is better. Um, I do think that it should be documented how the patient's feeling. This should be sent to the neurologist and talk about it. But terminating therapy session right there, that's not going to help this patient. Even like sitting down doing patient education. Remember, like, you know, because we live in a world of stupid billing with insurance, we can bill for patient education. So sitting there talking to the patient saying, hey, you can go to this person, you go to this person. Like, we don't need to stop the therapy session. We can even like be educating them while they're sitting there on like, I don't know, some Dynadisc or something to help with proprioception. Like we can do that and we can still do things with this patient, even though they feel unmotivated, we can try to get as much done as possible. And if all the thing we're getting done is patient and family education, like bring the family in, be like, Hey, can you grab your like spouse, bring them in, grab your daughter, bring them in, grab your son. Like, let's all talk about this together. Those are the things that we can do with this patient. So that is why number three is the correct answer because remember we have the right to educate the patient on what they should be doing. Like a patient might be asking you about pain medication and stuff like that. You say, well, I think you should talk to your physician about that because they're the ones who can prescribe you medication. Um, these, these are some of the options you could bring up to the, the, you know, the, the physician or whatnot, like, let's say you're like, I don't want to take any sort of like opiates or anything like that, or anti-inflammatories, like what's a different type? Well, we could be like, ask your physician about these other different types, like CBD or like natural remedies. Like what could we also do with that patient? You know what I mean? So I hope that this was helpful in explaining ALS. Remember big things is just as functional as possible for as long as possible. 
patient and caregiver education and energy conservation techniques, unilaterally distal to proximal. All right, guys, thanks for tuning into this one and let me know if you have any questions.